this is the presentation I'm going to make this afternoon. It's part of a, a project I had with NBR on the Chinese New Silk Road uh, that I started 18 months ago. And if I was able to keep uh, the deadlines, I would also be able to show my book cover uh, here. But no, you'll have to wait for another couple of months. I still have, I have already a title, which is China's Eurasian Century, Inevitable Question Mark. Um, I guess that my title today needs a little bit of deciphering. Uh, basically, I would like to take a look at uh, China's plans for Eurasian integration under its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, <clears throat> I guess that by now you're all familiar with this initiative, uh, also called One Belt, One Road, or OBOR, uh, that Xi Jinping launched at the end of 2013. Um, it's been regularly publicized both by the Chinese media and the Chinese government as part um, of, as a showing, um, Beijing's contribution to Eurasian um, development. Um, it has also become one of the defining uh, terms uh, and themes of the Chinese foreign policy. Um, much of the international attention has been focused on the infrastructure building side of the initiative. And what has been less acknowledged, though, it, this is part, um, the infrastructure construction is just one of several other tools that Beijing intends to use for a broader objective, which is Eurasian integration. And so if a country like China is thinking about uh, Eurasian integration, I think it's worth trying to figure out what the vision is exactly, what kind of institutional framework the Chinese regime have in mind, what set of rules they think uh, would uh, govern the relationships among the Eurasian countries. And for China's Central Asian neighbors, who are also courted by, China, by Russia, who also has its own ideas for regional integration, I think this is uh, even more pressing. Um, the Chinese leadership has clearly stated that uh, the Belt and Road um, do not mean to create a regional supranational institution that would be a sort of uh, Asian uh, European Union, for example, uh, but rather an Asian community of common destiny. So that's a nice enough name, but what does it mean exactly? Well, we don't know. Uh, it's not been fully spelled out by Beijing, so it takes a little bit of digging uh, to bring up to the surface uh, the, implicit, uh, the implicit meanings uh, of it. And I will try to do that today, try to uh, uh, dig up some of the context and then trying to decipher uh, what it means, what it could mean. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, what does this community of common destiny, where does it come from exactly? Uh, the previous Chinese leader uh, used it to describe uh, the special relationship Be uh, Beijing has, or rather that the, the Chinese mainland has with Taiwan. Um, back in 2007, uh, it implies basically that two politically def different entities can have reasonably good reason, uh, sorry, reasonably good relations despite their political difference. And Xi Jinping used the term uh, the first time at the April 2013 Boao Forum, as he was underlying, uh, underlining to the most uh, mostly Asian participant. Uh, the need for common development. He said, as a member of the same global village, we should foster a sense of community of common destiny. And over the following two years, he used the term more than 60 times, including in several of his foreign policy speeches. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when he addressed the Indonesian parliament, uh, where he announced the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, and a few weeks later, during a major uh, meeting on China's uh, diplomacy towards its, uh, its periphery or its neighbors. Interestingly though, he also used the term uh, in 2014 in the context of two major um, events related to security this, this time. Uh, during the first meeting of the newly created um, China National Security Commission, he noted that China needed to pay attention to its own security, but also to common security, create a community of common destiny, promote mutual benefit, and advance together towards the objective of common security. And a few weeks later, he also said during the SICA summit that we all live 
Um, in the same Asian family, with our interests and security so closely intertwined, we will swim or sink together, and we are increasingly becoming a community of common destiny. So that's about the extent of the official narrative. Um, it does not give us many indications about the exact substance of it, but the, context, uh, the context in which uh, the concept has been used can give us a few important indications. Uh, first, I think it implies the possibility to work together despite major social, political, or even cultural differences. Um, second, it applies mostly to the Asian family, so China's neighbors. And third, it has a diplomatic, an economic, and a security component, so it's quite comprehensive. To understand a little bit more about what it entails, um, we need to turn to what the Chinese public intellectuals say or write about it. And here I want to put a disclaimer. Um, what I'll describe now, it's not the official view, okay? There's no official view. Um, this is more like an informed speculation that I'm basing on what uh, the, Chinese public, uh, the Chinese public intellectuals, people who participate in one way or the other uh, in the elaboration of this official view are writing or saying. They inform decision makers, they are academics, they are think tankers, experts, um, some of whom participate directly in the Pol Politburo uh, meeting sessions. So again, just um, drawing on, on those people's work. What can we say about um, the model of integration that uh, the community uh, envisions? Um, well, the community of common destiny is supposed to be born out of uh, the Belt and Road uh, initiative, and it's not a supranational bureaucratic structure. It does not intend to create a new institution. But most probably, it will make the best use of existing frameworks, uh, such as the SCO and SICA for security, maybe RCEP and other future unilateral FTAs for the economy. Some um, Chinese uh, scholars also mention ASEM, the Asia-Europe meeting, uh, as a framework for uh, diplomatic dialogue. And contrary to treaty-based models of integration, it's not been defined geographically. There is no list of member countries, there is no institutional mechanism, there is no secretariat. For some experts, it, should still, it could still become a way for China to essentially form a bloc with those countries that are more or less depending on China's economy. Some also see uh, the community as a new type of coalition that is not directed against a third party, but which faced with uh, uh, security threats can speak in the same voice and have a united response. Others also note that it's not a military alliance. Uh, members, con member countries are not required to transfer their sovereignty in order to accept any military presence on their territory. So you see it's a sort of very amorphous, network-based uh, community, mostly built around China. How about the norms and values um, that would allow the community to move forward together? Well, here too, beyond the peace, mutual benefit, mutual learning, inclusiveness, and openness uh, that are supposed to be at the core of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and the, the CCD, there's no clear definition of what these principles might look like. The relations among the community's members are supposedly and I quote, jointly, uh, jointly built through consultation to meet the interests of all, and whether China, the biggest and most powerful participant in the community, will be willing to accept uh, the views and interests of smaller, weaker countries is, of course, another story. The Chinese elites are broadly, uh, they both broadly agree on the necessity for China to advocate uh, and set on a collection of Asian values that can be universally accepted and appreciated. So they all recognize that it's not sufficient for China to be the stronger in material in be stronger in material terms, but also that the country needs to enhance its soft power appeal. And both the public intellectuals and the leadership struggle to find anything that would fit this ideal description. Some have been thinking about concepts such as 
pluralistic coexistence, independent participation, striving for development, value sharing. So you can see it's not very catchy, right? <laughs> Other push for the adoption of um, neo-Confucian values such as benevolence, good neighborliness, harmony and justice. Nothing is yet fully formed. It's really a, a work in progress. It's, it's complicated to find anything that would fit <clears throat> from Beijing's perspective. But what appears quite clearly, though, is that the norms that are conveyed by this community of common destiny are conceived in opposition with the liberal model. So it's not something positive, it's rather something that is being constructed negatively in opposition uh, to the West. They reflect a broader general effort to discredit the Western ideas and institutions, uh, while China's model is presented as an alternative political and economic path and not just an alternative one, but a better one, a morally superior one, a successful one, contrary to the US-led system, which caused the financial crisis in 2008 and created conflict around the world. At the core, really, I think, is the rejection of human rights and democracy promotion. The official rhetoric calls that respect for the right of each country to independently choose their social systems and development paths. So contrary to Western countries, China does not impose any con conditionality to its partners, um, no government transparency, no anti-corruption measures, no commitment to good governance, uh, economic freedom, or investment in their citizen in exchange for <coughs> China's assistance or security cooperation. Democracies are not rejected from joining in, and that's why it's called an inclusive model. But neo-authoritarian <coughs> states um, have the same access to China's investments and benefits as any other country without any political conditionality. Um, the Chinese propaganda apparatus is still trying to find out what kind of values uh, could have an international appeal that would be beyond China's, um, um, beyond China's core. And their task now, I think, may be facilitated um, by a growing opposition to the negative effects of the globalization. Uh, China has been criticizing the US and the West uh, quite consistently since 2008, and lately I think its propaganda machine has appealed for a new globalization phase that would benefit more people. So this is, a, I believe, a discourse that might find its way easily, not only in the developing world, but also in some industrial countries. Um, if they take at face value and do not question what China really means by that. So where does this lead us? And what kind of role China sees for itself inside of the community? Well, China is the biggest and the most powerful participant. It provides leadership. After all, it was the one that initiated the, the Belt and Road, proposed a list of potential cooperation areas, set the agenda, the pace, the scope of cooperation, offers material incentives um, in uh, investments, loans, um, and also more under the radar, but increasingly so, um, security benefits uh, through uh, security cooperation. And in return for such benefits, Beijing expects that other members uh, of the community tacitly agree not to challenge, not to challenge China's core interests core concerns, or even uh, try to change its own political system. So the pattern of interaction uh, inside of the community seems to be based on an implicit contract between a culturally and politically central China at the core and its Asian neighbors at the periphery. And that has a taste of a little bit deja vu. Um, and in effect, it describes a Sino-centric regional order. China is a preponderant power. Other countries depend on China for security and trade, and also implicitly accept its supremacy and respect its core interests. So will, uh, will Asia's past become Asia's future? And will we see a, Euro, a Eurasian Sino-centric <coughs> order emerge? Well, obviously, as one Chinese scholar told me, uh, China cannot force this traditional hierarchical system to come back exactly as it was when 
the CCP was not the ruler but the emperor. The emperor. Um, so it's going to be a voluntary hierarchical system. <coughs> so how do you create some investment for the Chinese neighbors to voluntarily participate in the community? Well, you join in, you get some benefit, you don't, too bad for you. So to avoid the risk of being isolated and not benefiting from this economic development, you have to join in. Of course, this is not that simple. It depends on how other countries will respond to the idea of China being the leading power, uh, and it also depends on how the Silk Road values and norms that are starting to be crafted by the Chinese regime will demonstrate their universality or their appeal uh, in the region. And that well, goes back to Marlin's uh, uh, demonstration this morning. Uh, there might be a clash of, of ideas there. Um, I don't personally think that the Chinese leadership wants to take responsibility for the rest of the world. Um, I do not believe that uh, they intend to create the basis for a new ideology or a new international order that will replace the current one with new institutions and rules that they would create. Uh, but I, I think it might well lead the, um, to Eurasia becoming a sort of illiberal insert into the current <coughs> order. So we would have a group of countries that would not just be a league of authoritarian gentlemen, as uh, <laughs> Professor Cooley described it. I really love this image. Uh, but a kind of community very tightly <coughs> bonded to China, where the influence of Western values and norms have considerably diminished. So in conclusion, I think it is our responsibility in the West, first of all, to better understand uh, China's efforts to integrate China around a Chinese core, uh, following a set of rules that are in essence in opposition with the liberal <coughs> ones, and to draw some appropriate conclusion for our own actions in the region. Thank you very much for